They look like knights of old in their battle armor, and like their medieval counterparts, they ride for glory. Their mounts are not of gallant flesh, but rather of steel and man's science of speed. Today, the modern day warriors of two wheel motorsport will do battle in America's premier international motocross event as Sports Channel America is proud to bring you exclusive coverage of Honda's presentation of the Showy Helmets U.S. Grand Prix. About 60 miles east of Los Angeles, California, in the rugged Southern California foothills, lies Glen Helen Raceway. And today, Glen Helen Raceway is the site of the USGP, the biggest and baddest motocross race in the world. Hello, everyone. I'm Bruce Flanders, and we're here today as Honda presents the Showy Helmets 500cc US Grand Prix, and it is going to be a dandy one. The best riders in the world are here. Now, let's take a look real quick at the points race, since this is the final round. Already, it has been tied up by George Jobay out of Belgium with 266 points. Jackie Martin, fourth to him, second at 223. Another Belgian in third, Dirk Goofin, but look at the way those points come down around third place. Paul Malin from Great Britain, and still the American Billy Lyles has got a chance at the prestigious third place finish overall. Let's take a look at some of the competitors here today. This is George Jobay from Belgium, the gentleman who next year will decorate his motorcycle with the number one plate, and he deserves it. What's he going to do today, though? Hang back or let it all hang out? We'll have to find out. Another tough European competitor, David Thorpe, three-time world champion out of Great Britain, and he does well in the warm temperatures, and warm it is big time here today. Now, what about the Americans? Well, the favorite son is actually an adopted American, Jean-Michel Bale, the Frenchman, who's won several titles for the American Motorcycle Cycle Association and could win this one. He's already won a world championship. Jeff Ford, tough competitor, Mission Viejo, California. Got to sleep in his own bed last night. He's well rested. He's never won a GP, but this might be the day that that all changes. And finally, let's go to the younger group. Here's Damon Bradshaw. You talk about fast. This guy can tell the FASD. We'll see how well he does on a hot day. Well, the temperature here in San Bernardino, California is expected to top 100 degrees today. And it's going to be hot, hard on the riders. Probably a little tough on me as I run around in the pit area and head to Victory Circle. But the guys who have got it the easiest are up in the air-conditioned booth right now, and they'll be calling the action. Let's go now to Dennis Torres and Larry Myers. Well, as you can see, we have not made it to our air conditions booth yet, and it is very, very hot out here, Larry. Now, as Bruce pointed out, we have a stellar lineup of riders here competing at the Grand Prix. And the question is, how is this intense heat going to affect these world-class riders? Well, Dennis, any time you have a temperature hovering around that 100-degree mark, you add to that high humidity, and athletes are going to have trouble. I don't care what the sport is, football, soccer, or motocross. Pride and adrenaline will only take you so far. And remember, these riders will be muscling around 250 pounds or so of steel for two 45-minute motos each. It's going to be a monumental challenge. And speaking of challenges, let's take a look at this U.S. Grand Prix track. Now, if this race were run in 45-degree temperatures, it would be tough enough. But when it's over 100, it's diabolical. Larry, what's this Glen Helen track all about? Well, Dennis, in a few words, it's long, it's technical, fast, very physically demanding. But a map can't really show you the enormous amount of the elevation changes and jumps in the circuit. Now, I've been around motocross for over three decades, and I'll tell you this. This layout is worthy of the caliber of riders who will be competing. The man who designed this track is none other than five-time world champ Roger DeCoster, who I'd say knows a thing or two about this sport. I'd have to agree there, Dennis. Uh, he's one of the greatest that ever lived when it comes to motocross. As a matter of fact, you know, today, he's one of the promoters of this event. Now, for those of you who are new to motocross, we asked the retired Belgian to briefly characterize the two main elements of a motorsports gathering, the men and the machines. For the person that is um, coming to a race for the first time, uh, uh, the first impression is uh, these guys have to be just crazy and uh, just take a lot of chances, and that's going to make them go fast. Well, it's not like that. Those guys crash and crash themselves out of the race. The good guys, the, the very well-trained athletes, as, as well as a football player or, or any other top sport, uh, it takes a lot of strength, a lot of endurance, reflexes, uh, finesse and timing and all that uh, to be good on these bikes. Otherwise, uh, uh, there's no way that you're going to be in this uh, type of racing and in this level of racing. Well, they start off now uh, mostly with a production-based bike, which costs uh, $4,000, but uh, actually by the time the team gets through with the bikes, 
uh, the bikes cost uh, between five and ten times that, I would say, depending on uh, which factory. Uh, the, the most expensive component, components being the suspension, and that's also the most important that you can believe uh, to handle these rough tracks. Uh, they also use uh, the frame is chromoly steel, swing arms are uh, high strength aluminium, and uh, a lot of people use titanium parts to keep uh, close to the weight limit. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles out there, and uh, the bike has to be nimble and quick. Uh, the bikes uh, there's a weight rule that is uh, 102 kilogram, which is 226 pounds. That's the minimum weight for the bikes, and they're all between that and 235 pounds about. That's where um, the ship. Honda presents the Showy Helmets USGP. Come on back and see some great racing right after this. Sports Channel America's exclusive coverage of Honda's presentation of the Showy Helmets US Grand Prix is brought to you by Honda Motorcycles, the leader in on and off-road fun. Honda, come ride with us. Buy Showy Safety Helmets. Showy, ride with the best. And buy RK Chains and XL Rims. Being the best is a commitment. Joey, ride. Pre-wires of Bruce Blanders back in San Bernardino, California for the start of Moto 1 of the Showy Helmets U.S. Grand Prix. As you can see, the starting gate is full and we are seconds away from 500cc World Championship motocross action. And as you can see by the graphic, it is hot and humid. And yeah, we talked about that at the outset, Dennis. That could be a problem today. 105 degrees, that's without the protective gear. I estimate uh, conservatively, they're experiencing at least a heat factor in the 120s, and that is hot. Dennis, the gate is down, they're underway. 40 riders accelerating into turn one. Who will come out on front? Here's the race analysis. We'll be running two motos, each moto 45 minutes plus two laps. At about 2.15 a lap, that translates to about 50 minutes of racing for 22 laps around this 1.25 mile course. And it is newly crowned world champ George Jobet, number 14 in the lead, with number 67, Jean-Michel Bale, right on his rear tire. Now, these guys are no stranger to each other. Jobet is a four-time world champ from Belgium. Bale comes from France. He's now riding, of course, in the U.S. Both are factory Honda mounted. Now, at the beginning of the season, no one gave the 30-year-old Belgian a chance at the world title. His last crown way back in 1987, and since then, he's been hampered by one injury after another. I think someone, though, forgot to tell Joe Bay that he wasn't supposed to win the world championship. His competition was younger, stronger, supposedly faster, but the veteran put in consistent performances to clinch the title at the second to last round, and actually, that was two weeks ago in Luxembourg. As we watch the rest of the field, Larry, take us around this Glen Helen layout as we head to the portion of the track that is literally ingrained into the hillside. Well, as I said earlier during the track description, Dennis, this track is very demanding. Now, the riders are in the back part of the track where the sections that are literally carved out of the San Bernardino Hill. Our leader, George Jobe, is now approaching the chicane. A quick right-left turn that is followed by a very steep right-hand sweeper that climbs up to the highest section of this Glen Helen track. Now, as we watch George Jobe, Bradshaw, number four, Jackie Martin's climb of Mount Glen Helen, an old science adage comes to mind. What goes up must come down. And after this ascending right-hand turn comes a drop-off that separates the men from the boys. This is where the suspension and gearing comes into play on the motorcycle. Front fork assemblies and rear shocks are really put to the test. And just when you think it's safe to take a breather, how about this drop off? As you can see, Dennis, Joe Bay and Bale are still very aggressive. And we'll have to see just how fast they are through these sections around a, well, a half hour or so down the road. The leaders are now back on the front portion of the track, which winds around the starting gate area and the main grandstand areas. Glen Helen is a tough course all the way around, but those elevation changes on the hills are murderous. Murderous indeed. 
Here's a quick look at the World Championship scoring breakdown. Points are awarded through the 15th finishing position. As you can see, there is not a great disparity between points per finishing position. The World Championship scoring system rewards consistency over sporadic successes. And George Jobay, Dennis, is the rider that has been the most consistent throughout this 1991 season. He has his hands full, though. In fact, here comes Jean-Michel Bale. Bale makes the pass, and frankly, I'm surprised. With the heat the way it is today, I would have thought that JMB would have waited a little bit before he engaged the afterburners. He looks like an inspired rider out there today, and that spells bad news for the rest of the field. Larry said it at the top of the show, Jean-Michel Bale will be very tough to beat today if everything holds together. And here are the current standings, courtesy of the RKXL scoreboard. It's Bale, Joe Bay, Jackie Martins, Damon Bradshaw, and Jeff Ward. watching the battle for fourth position. Number 68 on the green motorcycle is Jeff Ward. He is in hot pursuit of number 69, Damon Bradshaw. Dennis, I think we should point out that while Bradshaw and Ward are two of the most popular riders in the world, people that are watching here in the U.S. may be a little bit confused because of the number plates they're carrying. Now, usually, and in fact all the time in U.S. competition, they have sing single-digit numbers. When they compete in the World Championship, though, they are assigned numbers that are not already taken by World Championship regulars. That's why when you see Americans competing in international events, they usually carry some very unfamiliar numbers. Ward has reeled in Bradshaw, and I would suspect he is about to make his move. Ward had a terrible start and has carved his way back into contention in a handful of laps. Here's Joe Bay, he's still in second. There's Jackie Martin, number four, he holds down third. And here's Ward, who has gotten by Bradshaw and is now in fourth. Larry, I don't think he'll stop there. Well, Ward is definitely, Dennis, I feel the fastest rider in the track right now. Jackie Martins and Joe Bay are not too far ahead of Ward. I won't be surprised to see Ward catch them as well. There is one danger for Ward, and that's the burnout factor. We'll get back to that in just a second. Here's the replay of Ward overtaking Bradshaw. Nothing fancy. He just carried more momentum through the jump and the rest is history. Now, getting back to Ward and the burnout factor. If he expends too much energy in overtaking riders now, because there's still a lot of racing left, he might find that they're going to repass him later. Earlier, we asked Ward to explain his overtaking strategy and how he judges when a rider is ready to pass. Sometimes it's real difficult to tell, you know, if a rider is getting tired because I, I basically my my thought is I think all all riders get tired at the same time. I mean, heat's heat, and it's just who's been trained in it and used to to riding while they're tired. And uh, the best way to find out how tired a rider is if uh, you know you're late in the race, you're getting hot. You got to figure they're as hot as you are. So you got to make a pa make a pass on them real quick. Just stick it to them, and if they're not tired, they're going to try to get you back. And if they're tired, they're not even going to try. They'll just drop right off the back. And I've done it hundreds of times where, you know, you're riding behind the guy and you're just burning up, and you go, "I got to make my pass now," and you do it. Next thing you know, the next lap you come around, they're six seconds back because they've just totally given up and they're thinking, "Man, he's not even tired, and I'm dead." And it's just psychological more than anything. And out here, it's going to be, it's going to be that way. If you're out front and guys coming up behind you. And, you know, if you slack off any bit and he gets by you mentally, you're done. You think, man, he's, he's not even tired, and you start dropping off thinking about the guy behind you, is he catching you, and that guy's gone. It's just you got to just know that everybody's as tired as you are and just keep going to the end. There you have it, Larry, one of the best ever. It's as much a head game as it is a contest of speed and endurance. Now the question becomes, how many more riders can Jeff Ward wheel in before the end of the moto? The next rider ahead of him is Belgian Jackie Martin on the European made KTM. Ward is on the Kawasaki, as he has been virtually ever since he was a multi-time mini bike champion during his grammar school days in California. And here's the battle between Jeff Ward and Jackie Martin. Ward goes to the inside and Ward makes the pass. Dennis Ward is in a groove. What a rhythm he's got going. He's negotiating this track and making passes without even thinking. I think that, you know, they've got this racing instinct and it's taken over. He sees the slower rider in front of him. He simply goes around him like he wasn't there. Jobay is about a second and a half ahead of Ward, which the way Ward is riding is nothing. We are watching a fantastic performance by Ward. Larry, here's the replay. 
And I think Jackie Martin was in the wrong line. He went to the outside, left the inside open. And uh, you can't do that with a rider with a talent who is Jeff Ward. He just pulled to the inside, dialed it on, and said goodbye, made the pass. We are watching one of the most dramatic performances in Grand Prix history. Number 68, Jeff Ward from Mission Viejo, California, is simply parking up the competition in Moto 1 of the USGP. And this is all the more impressive when you consider the caliber of competition out here today. There's the RKXL scoreboard. Bell leads Joe Bay second. We'll be back for more right after this. Welcome back to Honda's presentation of the Showy Helmets U.S. Grand Prix. We're watching the battle for second. That's 68 Ward pressuring number 14 New Crown 500 World Champ George Jobay. And this is number 67 John Michel Bale. He's led since lap number two. Now we are awaiting that battle for second as they crest the hill. That's 14 Jobay still leading number 68 Ward. What a battle it has been. Ward, if you've just joined us, has put a dramatic charge through the field and is really challenging now for second place in the first of two World Championship motos. Dennis, there's no question in my mind that Jeff Ward is going to make the pass. It's a, it's a question of when and where the pass will come. Now, in fairness, I think we should point out again that the Joe Bay has had the flu all week long. He's riding, uh, I would say, in a weakened condition. Jeff Ward, on the other hand, has the adrenaline flowing. So I go back and say, where will the pass be made? My guess is the chicane. As we told you, Ward is on the Kawasaki, Joe Bay on the Honda. Both are potent racers, but the Honda 500, as you see it here, has dominated the manufacturer's championship, winning the last eight world crowns in a row. And here are the stats on the current Honda. Like most of the bikes, it is a single-cylinder, liquid-cooled bike producing about 60 horsepower. It has a five-speed transmission, minimum weight under 230 pounds. A potent package indeed. And we're back to the action, and we are still focused on that intense Tense battle for second going on between the veteran American superstar Jeff Ward and the four-time world champ Belgian George Jobay. Dennis, Jeff Ward has made the pass. He's passed George Jobay to take over the number two position. Question is now, can he make it stick? Now here comes our leader, Jean-Michel Bale, rider number 67, the Frenchman, currently riding with a U.S. license. He's been here all season. We're waiting for that battle now for the number two position. And here comes Jeff Ward. Jeff Ward has indeed made it stick, and Dennis, he's starting to pull away from Joe Bay. One important note here, Larry, even though this course is raced on once a year at the GP, Ward and Kawasaki test here frequently, so Ward is more accustomed to the terrain and the heat, more so than his European rivals, and he is making the best of it here today. And Larry, here's the replay. Uh, no black magic here. Uh, Jeff Ward simply has the momentum again. He found himself a good line. He dialed it on. He talked about that a little while ago, the heat factor. Make the pass, and uh, I think maybe you make the competition think that uh, you've got a little bit more than they have, and that's exactly what is happening. So Ward moves into second, and Joe Bay is starting to drop back. Jeff Ward is the only rider in U.S. motocross history to have won national titles in the 125, 250, 500 cc classes and in supercross he has done it all yet he has never won a grand prix could this be the day i'm sure he'd like nothing better than to win today in front of this home crowd especially when last year it was a foreign rider who took the glenn helen glory and american riders hate to get beat by europeans let's go back one year ago at this race and the flashback is brought to you by rkxl when the gate dropped for moto number one all eyes were focused on a fantastic race long battle between reigning world champ Eric DeVore's heat rider number three and number 69 American veteran Johnny O'Mara. Watch as they split this back marker. O'Mara to the inside, DeVore's to the outside. DeVore's gets to the turn first, slams the door on O'Mara. In the end it was DeVore's at the checkers, Johnny O'Mara in tow. Now the second moto was even more dramatic. It was all Rick Johnson, rider number 65, and it was in uh, what turned out to be Dennis in his farewell Grand Prix appearance. Johnson came from behind to pass rider after rider to win moto number two, with Gabor's finishing in third place. An outstanding ride on the victory roster, Gabor's on the left, Johnson on the right were all smiles. Gabor's won the overall with a 1-3 tally, but more importantly, it was the Grand Prix swan song for two of the best ever. 
Glen Helen has been the home for this event for two years now, and in both events, we have witnessed some kind of special racing. The story today has been Jeff Ward. Like Rick Johnson last year, Ward has transformed this crowd into a frenzied mob, and here he is putting the bid on John michelle Dale, and he has taken the lead. The crowd is going crazy. They are urging him on at every corner, and it looks as if Ward is going to make it stick. Look at that crowd waving and cheering for the American rider. This is Grand Prix racing at its best. Ward is inspired today. He wants to put on a tremendous show. He wants this race. Well, it's real important. I've never won a GP. I mean, I've raced, I haven't raced that many of them. I've probably raced five in my career, and uh, just because of sometimes in the middle of the season, I'm leading the championship. It you know, sucks. Like, like, they don't want me out there getting hurt. I don't want to be out there. I've been for years so long, I don't want to ride one more race. So, you know, I'm, I've had everything in my career positive except the GP win, and that's really. It's really important for me to learn. Cook House is like this. European won it last year, so I think we have the Americans in there. This year, so it's a big old point. Going for it, that is an understatement. So far, this Moto Ward has reeled in and passed Damon Bradshaw, Jackie Martins, who's second in the World Championship standing. He passed the reigning world champion, and now on the last lap, the hottest rider in the world to take over the number one position in his home Grand Prix. Going for it, that's for sure. We've got one more moto to go, but there you see the crowd acknowledging Jeff Ward's effort. The first moto of the 1991 US GP has been run, and we'll be back to sort out the results and talk to our first moto winner. Takasago RKXL, the motorcycle racing chain and alloy wheel experts. More championships are contested and won on RK chain and XL wheels than on any other brand in the world. At RKXL, being the best. Win by Jeff Ward on the Kawasaki. As you can see, some of the 18,000 strong are being refreshed in between motos by the water trucks. And here are the first moto results. Ward first, Bale second. Joe Bay, despite those flu symptoms, a courageous third place. And Damon Bradshaw, the teenage sensation, fourth. And privateer Steve Lampson from California, an impressive fifth place. Paul Malin from England on the Kawasaki sixth. Billy Lyles, Bill Vine for third place in the championship, seventh. The veteran Lachine, eighth. Joe Martins, ninth. Another Englishman, Jeremy Watley, in tenth. Now let's go down to Bruce Flanders with our showy safety helmets winner interview. What most people would consider a well-deserved break, we catch up with Jeff Ward in the pit lane with a fan blowing on you. Is that about a cool feeling now? Yeah, it feels pretty good after that long moto out there. It is very hot and dry and uh, it's real important to get your body temperature back down to normal before you start out because you don't want it up a couple of degrees before you, before you even begin, and uh, this feels real nice right here. You didn't really get the start that you wanted, did you? No, I kind of spun off the gate, and I got off about fifth, and um, they graded the track and watered it quite a bit, so you could go outside and make some passes, and I passed a few, maybe got passed by a couple guys, but um, I knew it was a long moto and just settled in. I didn't think I was going to be able to reel in bail as good as I did. I don't know what kind of problem he had if he got tired. I thought he was playing a waiting game. Let me catch up and then take off. But he made a mistake. I got by and he gave up. So we got one more moto to go. and He's going to be real tough. Now, another one more moto left. It's not going to get any cooler. Same mindset when you go out there for this last moto? Yeah, I'd like a better start. You know, I'd be at the first and second so I can pace myself at the beginning. I had to run wide open for the first probably eight, nine laps to get into second. And then, uh, from there, I just had to keep charging to catch bail. I'd like to be there with them where I can run conservative for a while and then have a charge at the end. Congratulations on the moto win. Thanks for your time and cool down. Thank you, Bruce. And speaking of cooling down, Dennis, I would imagine Jeff Ward would love to hop that fence, leave the pits, get out into the middle of the spectators to be sprayed by that water truck. That would certainly take the body temperatures down. What this man is not doing is cooling down the racetrack. He's putting a little layer of water down to control the dust that'll make for Motorcyclist Association. Now I understand Bruce Flanders is standing by with another interview. Let's go down to him right now. All right, well, guys, as we sneak into the pit lane of George Jobe, he's been having some oranges and something to drink. You're not feeling up 100%, are you? No, I feel too weak today because I have, I have been sick uh, beginning of this week. I have been to hospital 
and uh, I take antibi antibiotic because I catch a flu. And uh, I had a good start for the fir that first moto and I was leading a couple laps and I was behind uh, uh, Jean-Michel Bale. But uh, after 20 minutes, I, I feel my, my head was, you know, I was turning and feeling very weak. And I, I, I thought I could, you know, I'm going to stop. But you know, I, I just really try very hard and do my best. And finally, I finished third, which is very good for me. But I think if I, if I had, you know, to feel well, uh, I think I could, I could fight with th those guys. The second moto, that's going to be just as tough, isn't it? Yeah, the second moto will be, I think, more tough because uh, I'm going to be more weak. So, But I do my best and we'll see. Well, on behalf of our viewing audience, congratulations on your world championships, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. George Jobay, now that's one classy racer. Indeed, and the title he won this year is the fourth world championship in his career. Next, the second moto. Come on back and see if Jeff Ward can win his 91 500 world championship, and they are underway. And in the inside, it looks like John Michel Bale has grabbed the whole shot. As you see a massive traffic jam, and one rider is down, a back marker. I can't really make out his number. Now, in between motos, Bruce Flanders has reported to us that Jean-Michel Bale suffered a rear brake failure on his Honda. This slowed him down and enabled Jeff Ward to pass him. The bike has been fixed, according to Flanders' report, and there you see number 67, Jean-Michel Bale, out in front. And Larry, I think there's a lot of pride on the line in this moto. Well, there definitely is, Dennis, uh, not only the party, but Jean-Michel Bale, who is looking to win his first ever 500cc World Championship for a Grand Prix. And as a matter of fact, I would point out that this is the first time he has ever entered a 500cc Grand Prix. But let's talk about Jeff Ward, who won mobile number one, and right now is struggling uh, in, back in the pack. Uh, he's got a lot of riders to pass. There is the pride factor. Ward uh, would like to round out his career with a Grand Prix win, and uh, certainly he would like to do it here in the United States. Pride gets all up and down this line. In second place, you see number 69, Damon Bradshaw. He finished fourth in the first moto. He is on a air-cooled Yamaha WR-based, and uh, he could be a threat here in the second moto. You see a quick glimpse of number three, that's Dirk Gukens. He is currently lying third in the World Championships, and no doubt he would like to better his performance in the first moto. Then, as you mentioned, uh, Damon Bradshaw is on an air-cooled bike versus a liquid-cooled bike. Let's spend just a second uh, talking about that. The liquid-cooled motorcycles uh, supposedly cool the engine and keep the temperatures down so that the loss of horsepower is, uh, well, it's, it isn't so drastic as with an air-cooled bike. Supposedly, they do a better job. Now, they've tested this uh, air-cooled motorcycle uh, throughout the 500cc National Championship Series here in the States. The difference being, though, our motos here in the United States are only 30 minutes long. We're looking here at 45 minutes because we're in, uh, in excess of 100 degrees heat. So that could be a factor before the motor was over for being Bradshaw. One footnote on the Bradshaw situation, that air-cooled machine is being tuned by the legendary mechanic Brian Muniz, who tuned the likes of Bob Hanna, uh, among others. There is number 67, John michel Bale, as you see the reflection as the sun is beginning to set and the shadows are beginning to lengthen here at Glen Helen. Even though it is late in the afternoon here, we are still hovering around the century mark. The drop of the gate of the second motor, he hit 101 degrees. There's the RKXL scoreboard. We'll be right back after this timeout. If motorcycling has seemed out of reach, maybe you just haven't reached for the right motorcycle. Legendary inline four performance is now within your reach. Introducing the Nighthawk 750. The battle for the lead at the USGP is on as number 67, Sean Michelle Bale, is feeling the pressure from the teenage sensation from Charlotte, North Carolina, number 69, Damon Bradshaw, aboard the Yamaha. Now, Larry, these guys are no strangers to each other. These guys are arch rivals, in fact, bitter rivals. Damon Bradshaw, Dennis, anyone on the racetrack is a good arrival. Jean Michel Bale is the best in the world. Earlier today, we took a close up look at this young man. Well, he has an incredible amount of natural ability, which there are and have been many riders that also do. But Jean Michel has the 
also the unique ability to want to win. And that narrows down the field considerably. There's a lot of riders that want to win that don't have this ability, but when you put the two combination together like that, um, it's amazing, he's unstoppable. Cliff Boyd has seen and worked with the best. His assessment of Bale might be considered bias, but those in the know agree with White 100%. Despite his on-track heroics, Bell has not had the easiest time fitting in with U.S. riders. He reflects on his odyssey off the track from that new French guy to U.S. Supercross champion. Yeah, I think first when I come here, they say, oh, it's, who is this guy, you know? And so the first couple of races, they say, this is just try to find who I, who I am. And after they know I am world champion, so they say, okay, it's good, he is world champion, and he didn't win any race. So they say, it's good because we, we arrived in a national championship and this guy world champion come and you know never finish a supercross race or finish you know not in the top 10 so they was i think happy and uh, but you know i start to learn and uh, just try to you know to getting used to the u.s and to the track and uh, now i make a lot of progress and i start to win a lot of race so i'm very happy to make you know the championship uh, and uh, i don't think they are very happy but you know i do my job there is number 67, Jean-Michel Bale, getting the job done as he speaks. Now, report from the pit. Jeff Ward is on the charge again. As in the first moto, he has worked his way up through the pack, and there he is. He is trailing George Jobet for third. Now, Jobet has displaced Dirk Kukins, who earlier curled down third. And there's a pass. Ward just screamed right by Jobet. What a move Ward made. Jobet got a little bit uh, lopsided there. He went way to the wall, Dennis. And uh, I think that he was a little bit uh, out of kilter, and that left the hole open for Jeff Ward. He just dialed it in, took that low line around the corner, threw a little bit of dirt and said goodbye, and he is now holding down the number three position. And I'd say uh, estimate maybe eight seconds back from Bradshaw. He has really pulled away. Now, Larry, here's the replay. Describe what happened here. Okay, watch again as uh, Joe Bay goes way to the outside. See, he faltered there momentarily, uh, possibly missing a gear. Hard to tell, but something happened uh, to him. And oh, there's Jackie Martin. Something happened to Martin. He's found himself up on the wall and into the banners, and uh, he's not going to be a factor in this one. Now, here's one rider who could very well be a factor before the day's out. Number six, Billy Lyles, who's currently holding down fifth place. Lyles is from Georgia. He's been campaigning in Europe over the last five years. In fact, last year, he was vying for the title before a broken leg put him out of contention. Earlier, we had a talk with him about racing in Europe. In the beginning, they, they didn't treat me so well. I was kind of an outcast because many of the Americans who've been over there before had left a bad taste in their mouth, so to speak. And, uh, you know, by staying there, I proved that I was willing to accept the ways that they do things and uh, work around the, the problems that I had to be there and everything and stick it out. And speaking of sticking it out, there is Jean-Michel Bale, number 67, who is sticking it out and lengthening it out. He now has a substantial lead over the field, and he is running faster in moto number two than he ran in the early stages of moto number one. This is unbelievable to me, Dennis, uh, in this, this extreme heat, and after all of the wear and tear, not only on the motorcycle, but on his body, that he is able to put in a performance like that. Now, while we were away, Jeff Ward, and that's Ward that we're looking at right there, has taken over the number two position. So Ward, all the way from 10th at the start, working through the pack, up to second. Now, we're looking at champions out here, the heart of a champion. It's not something you can describe. You just have to know what it is, and both the men out front have it. Jean-Michel Bale, Jeff Ward, and here's a battle for the number three position. Joe Bay has it. He has passed Damon Bradshaw. That dropped Joe Bay back to, or put Joe Bay rather up in the third, Bradshaw fourth, and we saw Billy Lyles, and here's that battle for the number three spot. And I don't know that it's a battle because uh, actually Joe Bay has made the pass and walking away. Now, don't you walk away as we check out the RKXL scoreboard. Come on back. of the United States Motocross Grand Prix. It is Moto2, and this man, number six, Billy Lyles, is currently holding down the fourth position. Larry, you've seen Billy since his early days in Georgia racing. This guy is getting better with age. 
But I hate to date myself, Dennis, but the first time I saw Billy Lyles, he was winning mini bike championships here in the United States, and he won a ton of them. Had a great rise to the top. He was a factory rider here, then went on to Europe, and is doing great things over there. And speaking of great things, this man, George Jobe, what can you say? Four times a world champ. He won that title for the first time, a world championship title, back in 1980. That was 11 years ago. When a rider is that successful over that long a period of time, he got to examine his motivation. We talked to George Jobe earlier about that very aspect of racing. I think that uh, Belgium is a very small country, but people are very motivated to do what they do. So Eric and I, I think we have the same, same plan and the same thing in the head is motivation. And that's one of the reasons why we have, uh, I think, he had uh, five titles and today I have four titles. Larry, when you talk about Belgian riders and world motocross titles, well, the two are synonymous. Indeed they are. As a matter of fact, Dennis, if you check the record books, you'll find that uh, among the Belgian world champions, they have claimed 25, 25 world championships. Andre Valourde had two, uh, Joao Robert in the 250 class had six. Roger de Costa and Gabors each claiming five in the 500 classes. Well, actually, Gabors was spread out. He did his uh, in three different classes, 125, 250, 500. And uh, Jobe has four. Gaston Rayer, uh, 125 world champ three times. So that country does breed champions. And one final foot on those Belgian riders, Malherbe and Rayer went on to win the prestigious Paris to Dakar rally. So they are not only prevalent in motocross but in uh, rally type events as well number six is billy lyles we talked about him earlier you saw the graphic uh, a couple of seconds earlier to substantiate that he is in fact holding down fourth place and putting in a sterling performance here in moto number two no doubt that billy lyles will be a factor in next year's world championship well i would like to think so and i think a lot of american fans will hope that same way uh, he started out the year rather slowly but uh, has really come on strong and speaking of strong what more can you say uh, delivered a lot of accolades toward this young man uh, throughout the afternoon, but he deserves every one of them. That, of course, is rider number 67, Jean-Michel Bale. This guy has done everything, Dennis, in motocross in the United States this year. Going back earlier, he captured a pair of world championships. He won one in the 125 class. The following year, he won one in the 250 class. He wanted to come to America, though. According to Bale, the world champions uh, are hollow unless they come here and beat what he claims to be the best riders in the world the American riders. So Bale uh, came to the United States and he has done just that. Earlier in the year, Bale captured the Supercross crown, he captured the 250cc outdoor crown, and is currently leading the 500 championship chase. Earlier, we asked him the difference between 250s and 500s. Yeah, I think a lot of people think the 500 is more hard to ride than the 250, but I think, you know, it's different because 500, you have a lot of horsepower, so you have to ride very smooth and try to be careful for the turn. If you make a mistake with the 500, you lose a lot of time. But, uh, so you have to ride very smooth and you have to try to, to be very precise with your, with your line and everything. So I like a lot to ride the 500 and almost, you know, I'm not fast with the 500. John Michelle Bale has displayed his mastery of the 500cc motocross machine all day long. Earlier you heard Cliff White talk about the virtues of John Michelle Bale. Larry Myers, in your opinion, what makes this guy number one in the world? Well, Dennis, he is what other riders would call a technical rider, and he is the best at being a technical rider. He finds lines that no one else ever sees. In Supercross, where smashing and banging is the name of the game, Bale just coasts through the corners unmolested, never hits anyone else, but he flat gets the job done. He just frankly is the best there is. So we'll take a quick look at the RKXL scoreboard, and we'll be back with the finale right after this.